Hey guys, welcome back to Task and Purpose. I'm your average infantryman, Chris Cappy. China claims to only operate one overseas military base in Djibouti, where they officially have a very small footprint of a thousand soldiers. Beijing says that unlike other superpowers, they don't deploy troops outside their borders for security purposes. They're not a bunch of imperialists. But is that really true? How do they guarantee security for their government's many interests abroad? I know I sound crazy here, but is it possible that China's 5,000 state-owned private security companies employing 4.3 million former People's Liberation Army soldiers is basically operating as a shadowy, unregulated arm of the Chinese Communist Party? Who taught you how to do this stuff? You, all right? I learned it by watching you. Since 2013, when China first announced their Belt and Road Initiative, over 200,000 Chinese civilian workers relocated to Africa, trying to find opportunities to work on its many construction projects. Belt and Road is an over $900 billion international Chinese infrastructure project. It spans across at least 70 different countries, with over 800 project sites, including the construction of railways, roads, bridges, airports, power plants, and mines. But the problem is, 84% of these work sites are located in high security risk developing countries like Somalia, where the dangers of getting caught in the crossfire of political unrest and armed conflict is very high. Now that sounds like my kind of party. Where do I sign up? According to China's own Ministry of Commerce, between 2015 and 2017, there were 350 serious security incidents that happened at the Belt and Road construction sites that resulted in over 1,000 deaths. And Beijing has made a big difference demand from Islamabad that wants a Chinese security company to guard Chinese interests in Pakistan. So how can Beijing protect their workers and overseas infrastructure investments? Deploying their People's Liberation Army for protection is out of the question for a few reasons. Partly because it would cause complaints of imperialism and Chinese military expansionism. The world would call them colonialists. It's also questionable whether China's army has the capability to sustain large-scale operations outside their borders. So, without deploying official troops, there's this massive security vacuum leaving Chinese workers vulnerable to attack. Are you one of the over 2,000 Chinese state-owned companies operating construction sites in extremely dangerous, high-risk developing nations in Africa? Do you need security to stop your personnel from getting kidnapped every week? Is the Chinese government not willing to deploy their own official soldiers to help protect you? Then you might want to buy my private army. I mean private security. Enter China's fast-growing private security and mercenary industry. It started in the year 1994 when the Chinese Shadon Huawei Security Group was founded. This was the first company to operate abroad. In September 2009, China's government state council created the legal justification for these groups with the regulation of administration of security services and guarding services. Now, Article 10, Section 2 is where this order gets very interesting because it says the private security company must be wholly or 51% state owned by the Chinese Communist Party. And so it's not just Chinese officials with epaulets on their uniforms. These are state-owned enterprises, ostensibly private companies. This allowed the CCP to legally use private security overseas who could use armed escort services. These soldiers, I mean contractors, could be equipped with rifles as long as it wasn't considered heavy military equipment. So no aircraft carriers allowed. So why would you need security guards at construction sites? It can't be that bad, right? In February 2012, there was a major crisis when 29 Chinese workers were kidnapped by Sudanese rebels. The incident revealed armed Chinese contractors working for an agency called Diwi. These contractors were on the ground coordinating with local police. In 2016, the Chinese embassy was bombed in Kyrgyzstan. The same year, the Chinese Diwi security firm was called in to rescue 300 civilians from the China National Petroleum Corporation, who had been caught in the middle of a full-blown battle between two rival factions in Juba, South Sudan. Mr. Kong Wee, head of Diwi Security Juba office, who's also a veteran of the People's Liberation Army, said, quote, bullets and shells flew over our compound all day and night. According to Beijing, the goal of the Belt and Road Initiative is to link the Eastern and Western world's economies, which would result in increased economic growth for these developing countries and raise 8.7 million people out of extreme poverty. But not everyone sees it that way. Critics point out that the Chinese loans have an interest rate of 4% when the Western ones are only 1%. 
and that these loans amount to a debt trap where the developing countries can never pay them back. This is what led to the rise of dangerous anti-Chinese sentiment in Africa. Because if you didn't know, China's on the brink of a total economic meltdown. And if the Evergrande crisis earlier this year was enough to affect even American markets, then you'll probably want to know more about what our partner Masterworks can do to help protect you from this new catastrophe. Because the US economy is already on the brink of a recession. And a typical stock-heavy portfolio is expected to flatline this year, according to Goldman Sachs. This illustrates why it's important to diversify your portfolio with alternative assets like gold, real estate, and art. The New York Times says when the stock market takes a dive, people look to invest in art. Not to mention, art had an average yearly appreciation of 33%, according to Masterworks All Art Index. Masterworks offers shares in these multi-million dollar artworks. And to date, they've sold six paintings with an average net return of 29% to investors. Even as the stock market is having its worst start in 50 years, Masterworks is flooded with demand as people are looking to diversify. So there is a wait list. But you can skip it just by clicking the link Link in the description for priority access. Who are these private security personnel being sent instead of Chinese soldiers? And exactly how many are we talking about here? Well, by 2013, there were 4,000 security firms registered in China, employing 4.3 million people, the majority of which are ex-People's Liberation Army soldiers and former People's Armed Police. So they're not soldiers, but they were soldiers a few months ago, but they're not anymore. I'm satisfied by that. By 2015, the number of security companies Companies shot up to 5,000, of which 20 are licensed to deploy contractors overseas. Now, they only report an estimated 3,200 contractors abroad, but the actual number is likely much higher depending on how you classify a contractor. For instance, Beijing DWE Security Services and Huaxan, Zhang, and a Security Group have a total of 35,000 contractors stationed across 50 African countries as well as South Asia and the Middle East and domestically within China. DWE Security has 2,000 contractors deployed to just one spot alone to guard the $3.6 billion Mount Bosa Standard Gauge Railway in Kenya. That China's been sucked into the game with the Road and Belt Initiative requiring it to use private security firms too. In Ethiopia, they're responsible for protecting a $4 billion natural gas project for China's petroleum group holdings. Meanwhile, a company called Overseas Security Guardians and China's Security Technologies Group have an additional 62,000 security personnel stationed in the same areas. Nothing wrong with buying protection for your workers, but, as we'll see, these contractors are anything but just security guards. Are we getting the full picture here from the CCP, or are they pulling some art of war style deception tactics on us? Why the need for so many contractors? The growth of the private security in China has coincided with Xi Jinping's ordering of downsizing of the China's People Liberation Army by 300,000 troops in 2012. There are 57 million retired and former PLA soldiers in China. You can't just release those now unemployed men onto the streets. Those rascals would get up to all kinds of trouble. Many were moved to the People's Armed Police and to these private security contracting groups. Why does the Chinese Communist Party need this protection? There are 10,000 Chinese companies operating in Africa, of which 2,000 are state-owned. China has made formal complaints to South Africa over xenophobic attacks on Chinese-owned businesses. The unemployment rate is at 24% in some of these countries, and then China comes in and brings in their own labor force, angering the local population. The CCP has a huge stake in these African construction projects, which generate $51 billion in revenue each year, according to China's own National Bureau of Statistics. President Xi Jinping even compared it to the legendary Silk Road that existed 2,000 years ago. But this project has come at considerable financial risk to China, with the World Bank estimating that about $500 billion at least was invested in 50 developing countries between 2013 and 2018. The only way the money gets paid back is through security. It's key to its success as every time there's an incident, it shuts down production and hurts revenue. And it's not just protecting private profits. It's also the government's geopolitical interests, which is where things can get a little bit of a gray area very quickly here. I've been calling these security firms private, but in reality, these companies are all state-owned by the Chinese Communist Party. Beijing demands all private companies obey their orders, and these companies are at least 51% state-owned. Because in every boardroom of every state-owned company is the Communist Party of, uh, of China, 
and they don't see any distinction between uh, public and private. It's all in, in the interest of the, the country economically and from a national security standpoint. Now that might not sound so bad to you, but these private contractors give the Chinese the ability to deny quasi-military and spy operations and lie about using them for geopolitical purposes. Private security contractors allows China to go around legal constraints that official soldiers can't limbo under. For instance, these contractors became private military when they were used to carry out covert spying and intelligence gathering missions. Chinese hackers stole security footage from inside the African Union headquarters building in Ethiopia that were Chinese constructed buildings were filled with listening devices. These devices sent back audio and the servers there sent back information to China for the past five years. The contractors do many of the same roles that are traditionally performed by uniformed service members like protecting oil and gas installations and even Chinese embassies and diplomats. Except the only difference here is they do not have to worry about any of the pesky regulations or laws that govern soldiers and no politicians back home are ultimately on the hook for their actions. There's very little transparency and even less government control over the actions of these Chinese mercenaries. Who are they accountable for? What are their rules of engagement? You might say that these Chinese contractors are unarmed and unlike the American Blackwater contractors, they are far cry from Russia's Wagner Group. But in 2016, Eric Prince, who was the CEO of Blackwater, worked with the Chinese government to create a Chinese private security company called Frontier Services Group. FSG invested $6 million in a training center in China that has the ability to train 8,000 security contractors a year in the role of what they call overseas security specialists, who are in no way soldiers operating abroad to protect China's companies that are causing generations of debt that is impossible for the host countries to repay. This Frontier Services Group would go on to build a multi-million dollar training facility in Xinjiang, where Beijing has had a major clampdown of their Uyghur Muslim minority. China has been accused of imprisoning hundreds of thousands of these people in camps. Xinjiang is an important region in China's Belt and Road Infrastructure Network. This of course raises questions about whether these private security contractors from FSG are working at those camps. Eric Prince denied any knowledge of this and has since left the company that he founded with China. According to the Chinese state-run media, CCTV, the private security industry is now worth at least $6.2 billion. What does all of this amount to? A clever move by China to essentially have a discreet military presence located in Africa while at the same time not being seen as a colonial power on the world stage. These contractors are simply a tool used by Beijing to avoid using the PLA to protect those overseas locations for now. Ye Huang, a retired PLA officer, said to Today Online, quote, The need for security protection overseas is quite significant, and the army is clearly not suitable for this job due to the potential problems it might cause for foreign relations. Wasn't it Mao who said political power grows out of the barrel of a gun? Don't get me wrong. There can be many benefits to private security forces protecting vulnerable organizations internationally. Many of them are doing great work that goes unappreciated. When it becomes private military instead of private security, when it becomes thousands of unregulated Chinese personnel who are being used as an under the table shadow armed wing of the CCP, it can create major problems. Pakistan has $62 billion of debt because of the Belt and Road Initiative that they owe to China. They're struggling to not default on it right now. The World Bank has come out and warned this could trigger defaults not seen since the 1980s. Using private security has financial advantages for the CCP. The cost of security is shifted to the companies, not the government. For a team of 12 Chinese private guards, it costs about $1,000 a day, which is the same as what it costs for one American or British contractor for one day. Even though a lot of the contracts specifically state that they're not supposed to be carrying weapons, there's proof that they often do so anyway. When one shot two miners in Zimbabwe, Dewey security firm announced a plan to build a permanent security base in South South Sudan. But I want to be clear, even though it will be staffed entirely by PLA soldiers, it's not an overseas military base belonging to Beijing. Private security isn't the only thing flowing from China to Africa. They're also sending oodles of weapons and military equipment. Africa in the past 10 years has become a very important and quickly growing market for Chinese arms exports. Between 2013 and 2017, Chinese weapon sales added up to 17% of African arms imports. This is up 55% over the previous five year period. 23 African countries, including Zimbabwe, Mozambique, Namibia, all get 90% of their weapons from China, largely because these weapons 
weapons are cheaper than American or Russian arms. It's also because China doesn't have any of those strings attached which require these weapons to be used in accordance with human rights records. Analysts don't believe that the arms sales are being done in a targeted way to start coups or anything. They're simply Chinese companies trying to earn some profit. They haven't gone full-blown CIA yet. Beijing's decades-old official doctrine of non-interference overseas is aging and showing its limitations when their investments in international infrastructure projects, like the Belt and Road, are required for continued economic growth. Without guaranteed security, Chinese workers will not relocate to work abroad. China now has more than one million workers living outside their country, but they're unwilling to admit that they are engaging in some of the same practices that they would say is the United States being colonial. And to be fair, China's loans are not fully responsible for the debt crisis in these developing countries. Sri Lanka has 50 billion in loans and only 5 billion of that belongs to China. The very real threat to Chinese workers has given China an excuse to deploy former soldiers without having to admit that they have thousands of state-owned security personnel around the world. China's going to have to decide if they want to go with the Russian-style private military companies that protect Russia's geopolitical interests and pull off covert illegal work, or if they want to do what the West has done and focused on profits at all costs. Right now, it looks like they're doing a little bit of both thanks to their control over companies that the West doesn't have. Thank you very much for watching. As always, I encourage you to look up your own sources, see what you think about this issue. If you liked or you found this video compelling, please hit the like and subscribe button, and I'll see you guys very soon. I'm your average infantryman, Chris Cappy, and this is Task and Purpose.